Institutions at Reno, and we are going to be looking at level one skills, which currently are constituted as being posture and sound production. That's what we're going to look at today. But this question that, these questions that I'm posing to you are questions that I want to continue to have the whole association think about because at some point or another, you may want to have it a different way. And if there is uh, a way for us to get to where there's a sort of a competency, I learn these skills, well, I just hypothesized to John Jones. What if we were to say, here are the skills, and each person will choose 20 calls, and they will make sure that when they're singing those 20 calls, they're using these skills. Not, the, not for the rest of their lives, not in everything they do, but in these 20 calls, they've taken the time to figure out how to do that. And then they come in to certify, and the, the, the certifier just pulls the, the record down, says, you got a band of, here, sing the first uh, uh, part of that song. First part of that song. First part of that song. And did you, and you sang 150 notes, and all of them had that healthy production, or all but 10 of them had that healthy production, you're in the 90th percentile, you pass. You know, some, some sort of thing like that. So you can walk out and say, I can do that at that level. Be thinking about how you would wish that to happen and share your opinions with your, the leadership of Colorado. Uh, John Jones in particular is the one that's moving along with me. And so, yikes, yeah, we've got a lot of bodies in here. And if we're going to do it the way that I want to do it, where everybody gets a chance to do some of this, we're going to have to step right on it. So will you, uh, I apologize from the beginning that I'm going to move quickly. And my, my purpose in moving quickly is to make sure that every person gets a little bit of individualized attention about the skills that I'm going to discuss. Uh, let me say again, some of you came a little late. There's a sign-up sheet here. Has everybody had a chance to sign? Oh, that's your notepad. You're thinking, this guy's got his notepad here. And then there aren't any names going on to it. It's not any more than it used to be. But literally, the purposes of certification are for your self-confidence more than somebody else telling, uh, sort of sitting in judgment upon you. Um, that, that's, and the other one is to give a structure so that it isn't the same thing all the time. Next year, I will follow up with this opening session for those that weren't at this year. And I will have a level two session that would then be the kind of session that you folks would want to come to. To begin with, let me talk to you about some fundamentals of singing. There is a vibrator in your throat, a motor, which is your breath, and a resonator. And today, we're going to talk about how you get the motor, the, the breath, and the, the vibrator in your throat to work in coordination with each other. The first part of what we're going to do is to talk about posture, the second thing that we're going to do is to talk about how you find that level where your voice works most efficiently. And then the third session has to do with how you connect those things together. And I, in the other sessions that I've done, I've made it through two of those three tasks, and they were smaller groups. So let me move quickly along. Would you all please stand? The right kind of posture for singing is the same as the right kind of posture for living except that you've all been living for a long time and you none of you have really good posture and so it can't be exactly the same. I want you to close your eyes as I come around and pick your pockets. I actually want you to close your eyes and I want you to rock forward onto the balls of your feet until you can feel yourself almost to tip forward. Then rock back on your heels, rock forward and back until you can find your gravitational center. Imagine that your head is tall your neck is long and your neck is back so that your ears stand right across, right over the girdle of your shoulders. The yoke of your shoulder blades or your, of your shoulders should gravitationally hold up your head. The shoulders then should gravitationally be centered on the girdle of your hips so that there is an alignment between your ears to your shoulders to your hips. If you found yourself in that position, let me just kind of walk up and down the aisles. And by and large, you all are, are successful at doing that. All it takes is you have to ask yourself the question. Some of you have exaggerated postures where you've lived the way that you've lived for a long time, and doing what I ask of you is nigh on to impossible. But if you can move in this direction, it will help you a lot. One other thing I'll ask of you is to take your, your right hand 
and take your pinky finger and at the base of your skull you'll find a, bro a bony knot or promontory. Find that. Now take your thumb or your forefinger and find the top of the thoracic vertebrae. There's usually a kind of a prominent vertebrae right at the top of your back. Find those two points and stretch them comfortably far apart. Not to the point of discomfort, but just comfortably far apart. You will find most of you are looking at the floor now. It's a nice, humble position to be in for the rest of your life. But it is not a good singing position. Now, look at me. I've stretched that long, and you can see that my posture isn't correct now. I'm downward, although my neck is long. As I put some pressure behind and push back on that, most of you will do this and you will shorten your neck muscles in the process of trying to bring your head back. That is the right answer. Here's the right answer. Now, how did I do that? What did you see my body do? Let me do it again. It wasn't my shoulders. Look at my shoulders. My shoulders aren't really moving. Something else moved. It was the whole of my upper torso. There are muscles attached to the, the cervical vertebrae they're called scaleni muscles, and they run forward through the flesh, and they attach to the underside of ribs number one and number two, so that when my neck is stretched long and back, it has a tendency to raise my chest. Another muscle is the sternocleidomastoid, starting at the mastoid process behind your ear, and then coming forward and joining to the sternum right here at the front, and it has another little side to it that attaches to the clavicle. With, that's where the name comes from, sternal, glido, mastoid. Those are the joining points. And when your head is long and your neck is back, that stretch will lift the, the sternum and lift the clavicle, and you'll find yourself in an elevated but relaxed position. Here is another way to find that. Take your hand, touch the points of your shoulders. Now point your elbows to the ceiling. or in the general neighborhood of. Now, with your, with your body in that position, drop your arms without, this, without letting your chest fall. Those are three different ways that you can find this posture. A fourth way to find the posture I will demonstrate but not have you do. You can come to a wall. You can put your heels to the wall, your butt to the wall, your back to the wall, and your head to the wall. And you stretch long. And if you're like me, Every one of you will feel some sort of muscular tension in the middle of your back, a tension that you're not used to, because we Americans are, ca are a casual folk, and we sit in ergonomic chairs where we don't have to build any muscle strength in our back. If you, li if you lived two generations ago where all chairs were straight back, and you learned to sit on your sit bones and not on your tailbone, then you'd know what I'm talking about, and those muscles would be strong. But we've moved past that, or fallen behind that, and therefore our posture needs some correction. Why is this important for singing? For two reasons. One of which is that the weight of the bones of your, of your rib cage no longer rests downward on your lungs. They're elevated so that the lungs are free to expand horizontally. The other reason is that when your head is back, your neck is long, the muscles that attach from behind here also come down, there's some other muscles that attach to the larynx. And when the larynx, when you're in this erect position, the larynx sits atop of the trachea in a very straight line and it makes it very easy for the sound to get out. And when you stand with that collapsed posture, it is similar to crimping a hose. When you crimp that hose, the air doesn't, the water doesn't flow out as readily and you don't get as uh, effective a result. So posture is essential to good vocal health. The second thing that I want you to do is to discover that the, the way that you make this vibrator in your throat work is an interrelationship by how, between how much air is flowing and how much resistance there is. Think of a hurricane and think of two uh, pieces of canvas flapping in the breeze. And when the breeze gets going enough, they'll just slap with each other. It takes more wind to take two pieces of corrugated steel and make them flap. And it takes even less if the two pieces that are flapping are cellophane. So the point is, 
that here in your throat, the vocal folds, while being very delicate, can also be kind of tense. And if they're held tensely, it will take more breath pressure to get them to vibrate than if they're held at ease and relaxed. Would somebody come hold the microphone for me? Thank you. paper represent your vocal folds. There is uh, an assumption that if I put the two of them together and then blow between them, they will, the wind will blow them apart. But just the opposite proves to be true because there is a law of physics, of aerodynamic physics, called the Bernoulli principle, which states that air in motion creates low pressure, low pressure creates suction, and it has a tendency to draw things together. That's what makes an airplane fly. That's what makes your vocal folds work, too. Watch. Knowing that they're sort of, this is like your vocal folds. When I blow between them, they don't blow apart. I'll actually part them and blow between them. You'll notice that they defy gravity. Hmm? Look at that. And they're drawn together by that air stream that goes between them. However, you can see the effects of the Bernoulli principle but that doesn't lead a person to good singing because there isn't enough air motion to cause them to vibrate. Here you go. There, I hit the, an, enough wind energy, enough suction to cause the vibration. Why did they vibrate? Because they were drawn together until they collided by that suction. In the split second that they were together, there was no more airflow and the molecules of air that were behind them started stacking up behind those that were in front until there was a sufficient impetus, a sufficient pressure to blow them apart. And as soon as they were blown apart and the air passed again, the suction was recreated and they were drawn closed again. So the opening and the closing phase of the vocal folds are actually simply managed by the laws of physics if you set up the right conditions. And most of us do not. Most of us think that we get our vocal folds to vibrate and we make our voice happen. We make the voice work. And the right answer is to set up the conditions where it will work by itself. Thank you. You can experiment this with yourselves by parting your lips at about an eighth of an inch or a sixteenth of an inch. But don't leave your lips closed. Just leave them apart and blow between them. For those of you that don't have enough breath moving, nothing happens. But when you increase the breath stream, the lips automatically start to flap. They start to buzz. And they do, except for those of you who are, are controlling of your embouchure, and do this. And with the tightness of your lips, it takes an enormous amount of breath energy to get them to vibrate, like so. And that's the way many of us sing, in that sort of trumpet kind of yeah! sound. However, if your lips are nice and loose and relaxed, and you blow air through them, they'll immediately start to vibrate. As you can see, your lips are about two inches, two and a half inches across. Set in thickness, they're about a half of an inch, five eighths of an inch thick. There's, there, there's a lot of flesh there to move. Your vocal folds vary from the width of my fingernail, the, the length of my fingernail, about six or five or six centimeters for the women, to about the length of my thumbnail, about seven, eight, or nine centimeters for the male. And so, they're, and they're relatively thin. They're much less flesh than on your lips. Therefore, the principle still works, but it doesn't take as much breath pressure or as much velocity in order to activate them. To experiment with this, I'd like to have you all whisper on a pitch. I'll just choose a pitch. Right, don't forget that you've got posture still, part of your vocabulary. Good. So here we go. At this point, stick your hand out in front of you at about four inches of distance. Imagine that you have a candle burning on the tip of your finger and blow it out. Now move it twice as far away and blow it out again. Did you feel you intensify your breath? You had to intensify the stream to reach that distance? Now double the distance. You read and feel how your body did that. 
you can feel a kick here in your abdomen as you intensify your breath. I'll go back to that side. Whisper. Stop. The next time, imagine that you have a candle at four inches from your mouth. Put that degree of breath intensity through that sighing throat. Whispering throat. Go. Ah. Then you perceive that already there's more sound. It's not a good sound. There's a lot of breathiness still left in it. But if there's more sound than there used to be, double the distance. And keep that whispering throat and intensify your breath through that whisper. Go. Oh. Can you hear the change in the quality of the sound? It's still not right yet, but it's much improved. Let me tell you what's good about it. It's easy in its production. It's rich in its harmonics. It's natural in its delivery. It's pleasant to listen to, but it can be yet again more pleasant. Now double the distance. Keep the, the whisper in your throat and increase the breath intensity as you did to blow out the candle. Go. Oh. That's very good. Could you hear the collective quality change? You should also have been able to feel the change in your own body. Okay, go back to the side. Identify for yourself where the, any sensations of vibration might be. They're very gentle. They're, they're at the point of the throat and just maybe a little bit above there. I agree. Nothing, no vibrations in your chest, no vibrations in your head. Just a little bit localized near your larynx. Now move it at eight inches. Now what happens? You start to kick some vibrational energy in the bones of your face, on the roof of your mouth, maybe in the chest underneath the sternum. Move it twice as far away. And now those same sensations that you had before are, are intensified. You get more vibration down in your chest, more vibration up in your head, and a nice, healthy buzzing sensation in your throat. All of those are positive characteristics of finding what I'm calling your energy threshold or the breath threshold. You understand how I arrive at that terminology. You start with a relaxed throat, and then you just keep adding breath energy until you hit the point where your voice automatically and spontaneously vibrates. We're going to have a seat for a second, but it's only going to be for a second. Are there any questions that you'd like to ask at this point before I move on? Very quickly. Identify yourself and then ask your question. Hi, I'm Bo Byerly and I'm from North Carolina. Why does it feel like sometimes it takes more energy to make the softer sound than it does the louder sound? There are several possible answers to that question, but I'll go to the one that's the most common answer. And that is that we, we fail to understand that when we sing softly, we still have to keep an equilibrium between the breath energy and the release in our throat. And most of us hold the tension level that is required for loud singing, and we hold on to that into quiet singing, and then all of a sudden the amount of breath it takes to activate that is very much more pressurized and it makes it more difficult to hold on to. Whereas, if you can find this equilibrium of if you can perceive what's going on in my throat, there is no change. There's ease on every one of those things. One of them is quiet. One of them is a little more intense. Another one is more intense yet again and yet more. And I've just gotten louder and softer. My vocal folds have just been responding to the amount of breath energy that's coming at them. Most of us don't really trust that principle. Um, and even today, as you've been exposed to it, you think, oh, that's just sort of like some of the sort of necromancy where you took lead and turned it into gold, or by sleight of mirrors, that's just magic. It isn't real. And so, on one hand, you experience it, but the other hand, your mind can't make sense of it, and so you hold on to that stiffness in our throat. Most of us, even in our speech patterns, maintain too much constriction and tightness in our vocal folds, and because of that, it takes more breath to activate, and that's one of the reasons why it takes so much energy to sing quietly. Any other questions related to finding that threshold in your singing? Good. If that's the case, now I'm going to ask you to stand up again. I want you to find your posture. You found it before. Use your own ways of doing it. You can either point your elbows to the ceiling, and then drop your hands, 
you can stretch Scott's at the back he's imagining a string through the top of his head like uh, some sort of a skeleton that's being suspended from the ceiling that stretches the spine long or you can just rock back and forth until you find that good posture good it's one thing to hit the threshold of your breath on an individual note it's quite another thing to hit it while you're singing a song that has many pitches to it let's sing the first part of Home on the Rain. Okay? We'll start right here. And I want you to investigate to see. Let's all hit that on threshold. Oh. If you hear, and I do, any kind of breath diffusion in the room, and if it's coming from you, then you're not on threshold. One of the evidences of not finding threshold is a diffused or a breathy quality, like this. Oh, nice, warm, friendly, slightly breathy, no intensity. Right. Here's another evidence of not being on threshold. Oh, how could that be so? The answer to this, how could it be so, is that either there is insufficient breath to trigger the Bernoulli effect and cause your vocal folds to vibrate, or recognize that there isn't a sufficiency of energy uh, either consciously or unconsciously, you take the, the vocal folds in your throat and you tighten them up to make do with the breath that you've got. And that produces a pinch or a press quality. This kind of a sound doesn't have very much air moving through it. It's very tight in the throat and it's very tiring. This, and, and it's a, evidence of an insufficiency of breath flow. This is also an insufficiency of breath flow. And there isn't enough to draw my vocal folds close, so breath leaks through and it gets diffused and weak. Both of those are manifestations of the same problem with people taking different solutions to the problem. But the right solution is hit the threshold. Just get your breath flowing. So, well, let's go again. Start on the whisper. Okay, now imagine them in your mind to move the candle four inches away. Now move it eight inches away. And now move it 16 inches away. Oh, good. Oh, give me a home. Oh, give me a home where the buffalo roam, where the deer and the antelope play. Okay, now, some of you think, that dirty rat, he pitched that too high for me. Anybody feel that way? Yeah. But the interesting thing is, if you trust the concept of this threshold, the threshold will work on those notes as readily as on those low notes. If your vocal folds, if your mind can conceive that fit, and you can, your vocal folds can stretch to it, there will be a point at which you hit the right breath energy to trigger those into existence. Where, where the dear? Here, there's no tension. Where the deer and the antelope play. And that means that the, the muscles that in your larynx control the change of pitch only have to worry about controlling pitch. They don't have to worry about whether it's loud or soft. They just stretch or relax to make the pitch go high or low. So here we go one more time. Have courage. Oh, go. Oh, Where the Stop. Now, for some of you, that was a pleasant but perhaps new experience when you got to Rome. There's something about that vibration in the upper middle part of your voice that is very pleasant, but for many men, a foreign experience. You have the ability, you just don't go there. As a teenager, you wouldn't go there because that meant that you hadn't had you hadn't become a man yet. Well, you're long since been done here. And now just be singer. Or, or something like that. Maybe I need to find a better way to say that. <laughs> okay. Go one more time. But I'm just acknowledging to you that as you move up into that upper middle of your voice, it still is very attractive and very easy. It's just different than what you're used to. So here we go again. 
Find your posture. Go. Forgive me um, where the gods are wrong, where the near and the end of love play. Good. Now, there are several people sitting in the, looking at each other saying, what the heck is this song? <laughs> But we're going to do it enough times that before you're done, you may not know what you're saying, but you'll have the words. You all did very well with that. I have a question to ask you. Raise your hand if as you got to where the dear, you felt an increase in pressure in your throat. Raise your hand if that were the case. Okay, everybody else sit down. You'll be back up in a second. Oh, I bet somebody's saying, I'm not so sure. I think I'll sit down. <laughs> oh, yeah, so, but the point I'm after is that when you sing, Oh, give me a home, there is a sensation that allows you to know that you've hit that threshold. How is it? There's no breath, there's no breath leakage, there's no tightness, there's a fullness of sound, and it just sort of flows out of you. So as you get to that point where you have to sing, just give your body permission to do the same thing that it's been doing. Think the pitch, let the breath activate the vocal folds, and watch and see what happens. Where the deer? Ready? And the and the and let me put to rest any concern that you might have in your mind that when you hit deer, that everybody will think that you're not masculine. It is just a male voice in the high range. And all of you have listened to singers, many, many singers, who sing in the high range and think, isn't that wonderful? Isn't that attractive? It isn't attractive when it's raining. But you're not. You're just hitting it in a very gentle and natural way. If, however, you allow your breath stream to diminish, then your vocal folds have no choice except to tighten up to compensate for the lack of breath. Okay, everybody back up. And we're going to skip forward to the chorus. Home, home on the rain. Ready? Sing. Home, home on the rain. Where the deer This is going to be a hard task to do, to keep your attention on the task at hand. But I want to have you uh, turn, let's see, uh, turn inward toward your nearest neighbor. So, you two gentlemen, you two gentlemen, come together. Is there anyone, is there anyone left who doesn't have a partner? God, does everybody have a partner? We got one person short. John, would you be kind enough to listen? Everyone, everyone that is on the right hand side of the room, that side of the room, will be listening. And your objective for listening at this moment is to listen for breathiness or tightness in the tone. There may be other things that you hear having to do with diction. You may not like the way they part their hair. That isn't part of the conversation. It's just simply, do you hit the breath threshold? Do you get your voice at the level where it will spontaneously vibrate as you saw the pieces of paper do a moment ago? Okay? So, at the beginning of the piece, oh, give me a home. Go. Stop. Reverse. People on the right side of the room sing now. Go. 
Now talk to each other. Talk about what you hear. That's enough. That tells me that there's a whole lot more conversation. In Okay, it looks like I'm grounded. I'm, I'm, this other mic isn't working, so I'm back on, on this kind of a mic. You guys didn't just confine yourself to the task at hand. You started talking about the weather and then your children and everything else because it got a little bit long. No, the, the truth of the matter is all you need to do is to say, I heard breathiness, I heard tightness. And a part of the answer could also be, I heard it being very successful in the low range and I heard it get tight on the top. And so, taking the feedback that you just received, if it's tight on the top, how do you solve it? You increase the breath stream while holding on to a released throat. That may be foreign. It may almost be counterintuitive for you to do it. Tough. Just do it. Right? Okay, so here we are at the beginning again with those who are on the left side of the room singing first. Try to capitalize on the experience you've had. Go. Oh... Now stop and reverse, but go back to the beginning. Oh. Good. That's that's good enough. Now listen, folks. Talk to each other. And give a, did you make improvement or not? Talk to each other. Please have a seat. Please sit down. Let me tell you something. Having another set of ears to assist you can be of enormous uh, value, enormous value. So if you have a friend who is a caller, uh, don't, don't just rely upon your spouse because they won't always tell the truth. I'm kidding, of course. You understand that. The spouses are always truth tellers, sometimes too much so. But nevertheless, if your partner is there and can assist you, Fine. If not, find another caller that can listen, that has a perspective of what it is that you're trying to achieve. There was a study done some years back about golf swings. What does golf swing have to do with singing? The golf swing is a muscular activity that combines the interplay of several muscles at the same time in a very smooth, hopefully, and rhythmic activity that combines gravitational and centrifugal forces as well some acoustical or uh, laws of physics as well. And they discern, and so singing is very similar to that. This study purported that in order for a golfer to gain a consistent golf swing, that swing had to be repeated a minimum of 3,000 times. And in the beginning, it's a very awkward and erratic swing, and the more times you do it, 
the better you get at it. Then, the next part of the study says that to move it from consistency, that means out of 90 swings, you are out of 100 swings, you do 90 or better, that send the ball where it's supposed to go. The next level is to move from consistency to habituation. And there are many singers who fail to understand that principle. So they take lessons until they're good, and then they stop taking lessons thinking that they're done. When in actual fact, they're not done until it has settled into the deep muscle memory. So often, singers who are trained will find themselves some years hence going back having to relearn the things that they used to know. But they fell apart because they weren't watched until they became deep muscle memory. So breath threshold, this, this balance between the breath and the vocal folds, that is both a muscle memory kind of activity, but it's a re-education of your mind's expectations for what your voice feels like and what it sounds like to yourself. And so it will not happen if today is the only influence that influences your life. It will happen, however, if you set up conditions to where you repeat this. How can you do that on your own? You can. How, to, how many times do you have to repeat? 3,000 times to get it consistent? If you were to sing either a call or multiple calls and repeat that activity, looking to get jet, the breath threshold energy, find that balance, and you were to do that 30 times a day, 30 sing 30 songs a day. That's kind of like a dance, isn't it? That's a lot. But if you were to do 30 a day, how many days would it take you before you hit 3,000? 100 days. That's a, a slightly more than three months, a third of a year. If you were to go toward habituation, so if you were to start right now in the beginning of April, sometime toward the end of the summer, if you were very conscientious, you should get to the point where you are consistently on that level. Uh, ease in your throat, fullness in the sound. If you were to continue that pattern, it would be 10,000 repetitions, which is 3,000 plus 3,000 plus 3,000 plus another thousand, or approximately a full year's duration of every day, 30 times a day. Okay, 30 times a day, seven days a week, that's asking a lot. So maybe I can do it ten times. Okay, if I can do ten of those a day, how many days is it going to take you to get to 3,000? 3, 300 days, nearly a year. Take some time off for holidays, and you're talking about from today until next time you get together, you get to the point where you're at consistency level. You're not done once you hit consistency level on this skill. That's just, you get it to the point of consistency. If you're going to move it to habituation, you're talking about one, two, three and a half more years of doing it. We're talking about the multiplication of years of consistent application for this to move from the point where it's a concept in your mind, which is what you have now, to an ingrained kind of behavior in your body, to deep muscle memory so that while you're worrying about the square, you're not thinking about your voice, but your voice does what it's supposed to do. So there is a way that you can monitor your own competency here by following those principles. Okay, any, any questions at this point about the application of breath energy or hitting that level of, this, this kind of singing has a name. It's called flow phonation. And you can understand the reason why, because there's a lot of air flowing. Studies indicate that trained singers use about three times as much breath per note, regardless of whether it's high, low, loud, or soft, than an untrained singer. So that's why it's called flow phonation, because the air flows. Anybody make note of the fact that even though you were using three times as much breath as you usually do, you didn't run out of breath? Anybody observe that? Was anybody surprised by that? No, not surprised at all. You, you, you just say you, you seem to have more. It flowed out of you. It didn't get constricted, and that is the secret. When you drop below that efficiency level, the breath leaks, and therefore it's wasted. If you tighten up to compensate for that, then you have to fight over the tension, and that takes extra pressure, and that also wastes energy. It's inefficient. The most efficient that your voice will ever be is when it hits that level 
where the threshold has been reached, the Bernoulli principle is in effect, and the opening and closing phase of your vocal poles happens spontaneously through no overt attention that you pay to it. If there's a comment or a question, you may have to come forward because I can't come to you. Unless we can figure out how to get this microphone alive. You want to play? Maybe the battery's warm. Don Beck. I kind of lost the physics there. You say that professional singers that do it properly use more air, whereas I thought you said that if we're doing it properly, we don't need as much air. Either too tight requires more air or wasting air requires more air. That's a very good observation. Let me see if I can rephrase that to help to clarify that. When a person is a trained singer, they, they generate that extra velocity of breath so that the vocal poles will be brought to full closure. When, they're, when you don't hit that level, then there is wastage. Either it's leaking or it takes pressure to drive it out. But in terms of how you perceive your breath, you perceive yourself as having more breath despite the fact that you're using it because that vigorous breath stream uh, is broken up into little choppy moments. Every time your vocal poles close, the breath stops for a split second. Then a little puff is let out, then another little puff, and another little puff. And then that, as a matter of fact, there is a major miracle that occurs right here in your throat where the energy that's coming from your lungs, which is aerodynamic, is changed right at the vocal folds to become acoustical. And acoustical energy sends out pulsations of energy, uh, breath, you know, m molecules bumping into molecules, which travel over space, enter into your ears, and your ears decipher it as sound. And we, can, we have the ability to hear multiple sounds and to sort it out and identify its location from where it's coming and the quality of it. It's a, quite a miraculous thing. But the efficiency of transfer from aerodynamic energy to acoustical energy, the more efficiently that's done, the better your singing will be. It will be more attractive. It will also take less effort to do and be less wasted. Did I answer that, Don, well enough? Any other questions before we move on? Okay. Now, I would wish that we could stand here in a full semicircle and I could hear you each sing individually. So let's give me my wish. Come on up. But we're going to have to move quickly here. Some of you are, are through the, the workshop several times, and if you will be kind enough to not do to participate so that those who haven't experienced it can do so. I would like to, I mean, this is going to be a big semicircle, so let's come on around behind. Oh, good, we're back functioning. Thank you. Come on around, all the way against the wall back here. Just fill in. Yeah, it's let, just make ourselves a big oval. We'll get a big oval here. All right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you not feel quite so stressed. We're going to start this a little lower. But to compensate for that privilege of not being stressed, each of you get to sing individually. Okay? And so I'm going to go through a whole series of guys, all, people, all at once. And then when we get to the end of the verse, we'll stop and critique with each other. Okay? So we're going to sing, Oh, only now we're going to sing, Oh, wait, oh. Now you'll have less stress on the high note. Everybody starts singing, and when I start to put the microphone in front of you, then I want everybody else to quit singing. So it's a bit of a secret, and I'll just be walking along. <laughs> so as not to surprise anybody. I don't want anybody to feel this growing anxiety that I'm three away from the microphone. You, I, there's no way I can avoid this, so you just have to deal with it. Okay, start singing. Oh, where the bop. Now, you're not listening. You're not following. When the microphone goes in front of somebody, disappear. So there's a reason for this. Every one of you needs to have the opportunity to feel what it feels like and sounds like in your own voice when you hit that threshold. And secondarily, it's really important for you to hear it manifest in the number of people that are here in the room because every voice is somewhat unique. So here we go again. Oh, give me a home where the buffalo roam and 
in the skies are not cloudy all day. Where seldom is heard a discouraging word, and the skies are not cloudy all day. Oh, give me a home, you rascal. Home, home. Oh, get we home, went home, home on the range. Home on the range. Home, home, home on the range. summer home in the other end of the range. Home, home on the range, where the deer and the antelope play. Everything was fine except for the very first note, right? Where the deer and the antelope play, where seldom is heard a discouraging word. And the deer in the, and, and the skies are not cloudy all day. Every one of you now, there was about ten, uh, seven or eight people that got a chance to sing. Each one of you in your own way analyzed, did you hit that, that level of threshold where your voice was efficient or were you below it? Don't have to answer publicly. In your own minds, you need to think, what did you hear and did they hit that? If there was breathiness in the tone, they were below the level. If there was tightness in the throat, they were below the level. It, when you hit that level, all of a sudden the voice becomes rich and full and natural and flowing. So here we go again. Picking up. Everybody start. Oh, give me a home where the buffalo roam. Now do that again with plenty of flow. Where the buffalo where the buffalo roam. That's already an improvement, but now watch. Here's the candle. Blow it out. Relax in your throat, but here's the candle. Where the buff, where the buffalo roam. Bravo. Try and remember the words. Where the deer, deer where the deer and the ant. Where the deer and the antelope play. And you notice that as you got lower, you had trouble. Yeah. So if, if you listen to that and you're trying to help somebody else, where the deer and the antelope, just keep the energy flowing down there. Where the deer? Where the deer and the antelope play. Where seldom is heard a discouraging word. And the skies are not cloudy all day. Home, home on, home, home on the range where the deer and the antelope play. Where seldom is heard a discouraging word. And the skies are not cloudy all day. Oh, oh, oh give me a home. Now we got on a roll. Oh, give me a home where the buffalo roam, where the deer and the antelope play. <laughs> I don't know the word. The skies are not cloudy all day. Home, home on the range, where the deer and the antelope play. Oh, give me a home where 
of the buffalo roam, where the deer and the antelope play. Where seldom is heard a discouraging word, and the clouds are not cloudy all day. It's an interesting thought. <laughs> home, home on the range, where the deer and the antelope play. Where seldom is heard a discouraging word, and the skies are not cloudy all day. Now, every one of you were successful, and some to more measure than others, but no one was unsuccessful in doing that. Raise your hand if you were singing differently than you normally do. Somewhat. No, no, yeah. If you don't raise your hand, I'm coming back at you. <laughs> no, the truth is, all of you had some difference in the way that you sang. All of your voices had a certain pleasing, mellow, friendly quality to it. And that's one of the byproducts of singing with this kind of approach to singing. It just doesn't require so much work. Did you not acknowledge that? Of course, you were all frightened to be singing alone and trying to remember the words or making them up as you go. <laughs> but that has nothing to do with whether or not you get the sense of passivity in your throat and activity in the movement of your breath. Good. Now, boy, that's, that's cool. We're making good progress. How are we doing on time? What does that mean? I have a half an hour? Oh, great. All right. I need a volunteer. Lana did it already. Come on, you be the demonstrator. Come on up. Come on. Okay, now, now this next thing that I'm going to, to demonstrate for you is a way to find connection with your voice. When you sing with this flowing breath, one of the feelings that you get is a loss of connection. If you're used to compression in your voice and you get flowing breath, then of a sudden you don't feel like you have as much control over your voice. You sing, Oh, give me a home. There's some, comp some compression in that. Oh, give me a home. There's a lack of compression in that. So what you need to do is to find a way to keep this all connected together. I need somebody to hold the microphone. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Bjorn, would you put your hands against mine and push against? Push. Good. Now, that's one form of connection. Um, well, I'm not going to ask you to sing um, Home on the Range. Can you sing something else? It can be the beginning of a singing tip. It can be uh, a folk song or a patriotic song from your own country, whatever you would wish. <laughs> he said, I didn't know I was getting into that. <laughs> Put it over by him. Lille Peter hedder kom, kravlet op af væggen, eller sådan noget, tror jeg en nok det går. Her... That's enough. Oh, but there's a high note coming. We'll come back to that. <laughs> <laughs> Now, uh, Bjorn, when you did that, when we were leaning together, could you feel the connection in our hands? That Here, just do it with one hand. Push against. Now come back toward your shoulder. Come, come back toward your shoulder. Let your hand come back toward your shoulder. Okay. okay, so all the way. Now push toward my shoulder. Push, 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 push. We stay connected. Now we're going back toward his shoulder. And now he's going to come back toward me. And if I get really stiff and uncooperative, then we're both working very hard, but no good is happening. Or, now keep coming, keep coming, and... That's the other thing that you don't wish to have happen. You don't wish to disengage where they come apart, nor do you want to, to get so stiff and rigid that there's a lot of work but no good product that comes from that. Just in case. Now, here we go again. Little Peter Hedder, come, call up a vacant. 
da kam Schulen, Herr Peter Schroll. <lacht> da kam rein in Schule Peter Nil, Lille Peter Illerkopf, Kaule Lappikin. That's very good. Now, I have to ask you, Bjorn, were you on the threshold of your breath? I think that you were, by and large. But there was something else that came as the result of that. There was strength in your singing, was there not? Part of it was uh, in response to that muscle energy. Could you figure out what it was that you were doing inside your body that was like what we were doing with our hands? And each one of you, well, just pair off with each other and push against each other. Find a, find a partner. If we need to borrow somebody from the audience, be prepared to stand forward. Now, lean against each other. Let your, let your palms of the person who is, um, I don't know, how would you say that, in the circle, the person to the right, bring your hands back towards your shoulder. Yeah, back. That's the, the person on this side. On this side, let the hands come back towards your shoulders. This way, the person that is counterclockwise. Yes. Now, push. Push. No, I don't have it quite right yet. Bring your hands back toward, toward your shoulders. Now push backward, push toward the shoulders of the other individual now. Push, and just keep enough engagement so that your hands stay together. You don't have to fight. Now return to the home place. Come back to the other person's shoulders. This time, push as that your hands represent the way that you sing. And if let's say that you're singing gently now. So move your hands toward the other person's shoulders gently. And then return, gently. Now, let's say that you're singing with more force, more forcefully. And you want, to, you want to meet each other with equal resistance so that you never are in danger of coming apart. All right. I need somebody to hold the microphone now. No, okay. All right. So, we are going to do this one more time. First, can you decide what's the very first word that you say? Le, le, le. Make it uh, sighing, whispering on pitch. Now bring your breath in and feel up. Le, 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 Lille Peter, Lille Cobb, Carl Lappikin. That was very good, didn't you think? <laughs> Stay where you are. Now, form your groups again, and we're going to go back to Home on the Range. <laughs> I'm okay for now. I'm okay. You two lean against. I'm all right. And we need another partner there. Everybody got a partner? So come back toward the shoulders of the individual who is on the clockwise side of the circle. That's reverse of the way we did it before. The person that's on this side, bring your hands back toward your shoulders. Bring your hand the other way. Uh-huh. Back toward. Okay, so as you sing, you're moving toward the other person. Whoever is pushing is singing, phrase by phrase. Then when the hands come back that way, you reverse. So You'll see, watch me, it is this way. Oh, give me a home. Then the other person sings, where the... Okay, you see how that works? Okay, you see how it works? Let's go, sing. Oh, give me a home. Reverse. Stop. Now, I thought that that was universally successful. Did you, who are listening out there, did not find that to be an attractive quality of... I ought to bring a choir director, I ought to bring a choir director into this crowd and then you'd all be recruited. John. John Carlson's honor. What we saw from the back was a lot of you were changing your posture. 
and you were leaning forward at the waist when you were doing the singing instead of just pushing with the arm, and it affected their tonal controls. Thank you for that observation. Okay, I need another volunteer now. Bjorn? What part of another didn't I understand? <laughs> For being a second or a third language, he's pretty astute, isn't he? <laughs> okay, so you all, all saw a form of engagement that was brought about by us pushing against each other. Here is yet a different kind of engagement. Will you take my hand? Now pull back, pull, lean. That is the form. Now put your microphone in front of Bjorn's mouth as he sings again. So every note that you sing, Bjorn, you're going to stretch rather than push. Go. Lille Peter Hiller kom, kravlet op af væggen. Så kom regnen, skyllet Peter ned. Så kom solen, varmet Peter op. Lille Peter Hiller kom, kravlet op igen. Thank you. Now let's ask a question. Did that feel differently than the pushing kind of engagement? Uh, not so easy. More difficult. Was it more, more difficult to pull? Ah, that's very interesting. That's very interesting because I actually like the sound better. How about the rest of you? Okay, so we're going to push with one hand. Okay, and then what's going to happen? No, we're going to push this way. One phrase pushing, one phrase pulling. Okay. Lille Peter. Lille Peter Edder kom, kravlet op af væggen. Så kom solen, kravlet rammet Peter om. Så kom regnen, skyldet Peter ned. Lille Peter Edder kom, kravlet op igen. Yeah. Now, could you hear? Both forms, both forms give some sense of engagement. You all felt it, and when you were pushing against each other, the sounds were quite vigorous and they were very attractive. But now it's time to try the other way. Now, I want you to take hands by the right hand with your partner and lean back against each other. As you did before, the first phrase, uh, the person who is on this side sings, that is on the clockwise, and then the second phrase is the counterclockwise person. But every note needs to have a stretch, needs to have a counterbalance rather than a push. You all felt the push a moment ago. Now you're going to feel the pull. Go ahead or give me a home. Oh. Reverse. Reverse. Keep going. Reverse. 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 And the skies are not cloudy all day. Okay, time out. Look, let me let me just take a second. John's here to comment, but I want to I want you to each acknowledge what happened in your bodies. I thought that the sounds were quite attractive. They were different than the pushing sounds, but they were equally as engaged, but they had something else working for them, and I'll describe that in just a moment. Hey, John Collins, again. Looking from the back, because we made the comment the last time about the posture, all of you maintained a better singing posture, and it made a difference in the tonal controls that we heard. Thank you very much. What I heard is that when you were stretching the notes, when you were tugging, when you were counterbalancing each other, the tone got cleaner, had a better center to it, was more true to pitch, and was more stable. The other one was attractive, but not as successful. So now, 
what I want you to do with your partner is to push the first phrase, pull the second phrase, push the third phrase, pull. So what that's going to mean is that the first person who is over here on the clockwise side will sing one phrase pushing, one phrase pulling, then you will reverse, and one phrase pushing, one phrase pulling. I want you to feel this in your own bodies. Are you ready? Remember your posture. Remember that you're trying to do this on that threshold of energy, but this now gives you a different sense of connection. One, two, three, go. Pull. Reverse. Pull. Reverse. Pull. Reverse. Push. Push, reverse. Reverse. Please, everybody, take your seats and let's talk a little bit. <laughs> okay, there was a very pertinent question that was whispered in my ear as you were going back to your seats. How do I practice this by myself? There are several ways to do that. First of all, did you each one sense a, uh, an energetic connection in your body when you were doing that pushing and pulling that was above and beyond the kind of commitment level that you did before you understood that that was supposed to be part of it? It starts with passive throat, active airflow, but that in and of itself will not energize the voice to make it commanding. The connection is the next element that adds to that. And you can get that connection either by pushing or by pulling. As you pushed, comment, any one of you that care to, comment about what you sensed in your own body and what you heard in your partner. Anybody, show of hands, anybody want to say anything? Okay, I'll say it for you. <laughs> now, here comes a, a tentative suggestion. I'm asking you to do some thinking here, and I know that's hard on the second day. Uh, Bosco Bossler from Idaho, and as I was pushing, I could feel the, the, the stomach muscles tightening up to push on the diaphragm. The muscles that you, Bosco, the muscles that you actually felt at work were the abdominal girdle contracting inward, and they were contracting against something else and that compression right here at the lower part of your ribs was part of that pushing activity. The abdominal girdle are the ones that are responsible for pushing the air out of your body, and your diaphragm is responsible for holding the air in the body. And so the, the, the engagement between the two hands is symbolic of that engagement that happens at the bottom of your body. But you are exactly right in describing that there was something energetic happening right here in the lower part of your body, right at the base of your ribs. Anybody else? Comment here. What's the crazy Branson? I feel a little bit lightheaded. That's because you didn't wear your toupee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was, there was actually more oxygen moving through your body than normally there would be. And that often is a, a circumstance that happens. When people are using more air than they're accustomed to, they find themselves with more oxygen than they know what to do with and therefore they can get lightheaded. You can get lightheaded. However, it is something that you can become accustomed to and adapt to without any great difficulty at all. Now, how about the tugging portion? Anybody make any observations? As you stretched back, it seemed like you were arching your, oh, I'm sorry, Bo Byerly, I'm from North Carolina. And as you tugged back, it seemed like you arched your back the least little bit and that increased the capacity of your lungs. It felt like there was more air in there. 
it certainly was working more efficient and you didn't feel the, the sense of compression. And when you push against yourself, you do get a sense of engagement, but you also get a sense of compression that over time can build up underneath the vocal folds and create pressure. Whereas this tugging seems to reduce that and makes the air move uh, more smoothly. There is another comment that I observe that none of you have commented upon. And that is when you arrive at the high notes, the high notes seem to be very stable and untense. Did any of you nodding your head to the acknowledgement of that? Yeah, I, I think that this, many, many people describe their greatest anxiety in calling as the stretch to the high notes. The high notes just, you take this lower pitch and you push it up there and you can get it, but it quavers and it trembles and it isn't always trustworthy. But with this sense of counterweighting, counter-stretching, counter-balancing, however you observe it, that seems to open that upper range to the body of the, of, I'm sorry, upper range of the singing voice uh, to be uh, more accessible, more easily accessible. Of course, there were all of you singing together, so there was a sense of camaraderie that allowed you to be, um, exercise a certain amount of reckless abandonment, which you don't get when you're by yourself. Now, the question that was raised initially, how do you do this by yourself? It is actually fairly simple. If you really preferred the pushing kind of engagement, you just come over to the wall and, oh, give me a home where the buffalo roam. And not only do you sing with engagement, but you build your triceps and you build your shoulder muscles. <laughs> and you get yourself in pretty good shape. On the other hand, if you don't want to do that, if you want to do the pulling, you find a door jam or a, a corner of a wall. Oh, give me a home where the buffalo roam. And as you get better than at this, there's no magic in the door jam. There's really no magic in the pushing or the pulling. What really is happening is that these become outward manifestations of something that goes on on the inside of your body. And so your objective is to sense that, sense the pushing, sense the pulling, quit pushing or pulling, and see if you can hold on to those sensations inside of your body. Soon, you'll get to the point where just a simple visualization, oh, give me a home, and for those that are listening to the tape, I'm stretching my hands apart while I'm singing as if I had a rubber band, a big rubber band between my hands. If you have exer exercise bands at home, you can, I have one that's got a loop in it where I put my foot through it and then I do curls. Oh, give me a home. The stretch is the issue that's at hand. Or you take one of these kind of compression tools. Oh, give me a home. And you then observe, while you're doing this with your arms, what's going on inside your body. Then, can I keep that which is going on inside my body consistent while I don't do the thing, whether it's pushing or pulling? I personally like the pull better than I like the push, and I like it better in your voices, but I acknowledge that both of those give a sense of connection in your body that's essential to energize your voice. And it keeps the pressure away from your throat and down in the musculature of the breathing where it belongs. Georgia Bailey. When you are pushing against <laughs> Georgia Bailey, when you are pushing against the wall, how is that um, affecting the rib cage? Is it expanding the rib cage as you're pushing? I'm unclear about that. It really should have no effect because the muscles you're using are in your shoulders and in your arms. It's just an external um, visualization and of what should be going on in the inside of your body. Likewise, the pulling uh, uses the shoulder muscles, the strap muscles of the neck, and the arm muscles, but should not necessarily affect negatively your breathing. Scott Byers, Sacramento, California. Um, while you were doing that, I was thinking one of, the, one of the things that all of us do is we drive a lot, and this might be a good exercise to do in the car with the steering wheel, just as long as you don't. <laughs> Did you create, you could pull or push with the steering wheel. On both sides. That is correct. I don't want to oversell the activity. The activity is just a trick. It's just a way 
so that in a very physical and tangible way you can feel a sense of connection. And that's the thing that has to be developed inside of your body so that the activity that you have going on in the lower part of your abdomen and in your rib cage has some effect and some connection with the activity that's going on in your throat. When I said to you that your vocal folds, in order for the Bernoulli effect to work best, should be passive, I didn't tell the truth. I confess. It's a good way to start. But that doesn't, all that does is give me nice, warm, and gentle fuzzies. And how many of your calls are nice, warm, and gentle fuzzies? No, they're, they're, they're energetic. Most of the time, they're commanding. And that's when this is not sufficient, not because it's not healthy, but because it produces a sound that doesn't match the energy level that you want. And that's where the engagement portion comes. Not because you tighten up your throat, but the muscles become slightly more toned, and the energy as the breath passes through is slightly more energized, and you keep an equilibrium, a balance, which you would describe as hitting that threshold, but it becomes more uh, energetic, more connected. Okay, it's time for questions or comments. Let's take a few moments. Tell me what the time is like now. Good, excellent. It's time for questions and so forth. Bob, Bob Joy from Olympia, Washington. I'm just starting to work with a vocal coach, but I found that when you talk to somebody who's not from the square dance activity, they don't know what you're looking for. Now, is there any difference between what they would teach any other singer as to what they would teach to a square dance caller? Yes, there is. Because if, they, if a voice coach is accustomed to teaching classical, operatic kind of singing, they will encourage you to overproduce your voice. They will be interested in one thing and one thing alone, and that is something called the singer's ring. That singer's ring gives an enormous projection to the voice without amplification. It sounds terrible coming through a microphone. It overloads the microphone. It has high frequencies, and it causes noise in the microphone. There are many styles of singing that don't want ring, but opera singers want it because if they're singing over a 100-piece orchestra to an audience of 3,000 people, they can't be heard if they don't have it. And so there are many voice teachers who emphasize that tradition, and that tradition, that particular skill, isn't something that a square dance caller needs. In our, in our level two, um, I'll talk about resonance tuning and put that little sound into its context. So as you're looking for a vo vocal coach, anybody of you who are looking for a voice teacher, indicate to them that you are square dance callers and the kind of music that you sing is akin to folk song or popular song. There are a number of very, very fine folk song anthologies with accompanying CDs that you can buy to take to your voice coach to have them work with you to produce a kind of quality that is easy, natural, and friendly but healthy. So that's what I would encourage you to do. Identify yourselves as folk singers of that genre and have them train you to be a healthy folk singer. And if they look at you as if you just spoke in some foreign language, turn and walk out the door. Kind of related to that question, Mike Oliveri from Denver. The exercise we did here on Home on the Range was nice, but it was slow. Now, most of us call 120 to 126 beats per minute. What happens when we speed that up? It speeds up. <laughs> the nice, the, <laughs> the simple answer is that it, that which you did slowly here, because it was new to you, has to come a part of your skill sets so that when you move quickly, you're just as adept at it. And that's no different from your dancers, who start slowly, and gradually you can pick up the uh, pace, you can more, make the commands more uh, complicated, and they can absorb it because they've grown into it. The same thing for you folks. Moving very slowly, you can self-monitor. At faster pace, you can't self-monitor as well, so you have to be more adept at what you're doing. How many times do you have to repeat this before it becomes consistent? 3,000 times. Before it becomes habitual? 10 minimum. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, did I misunderstand? Uh, Ron Marcus, I was wondering, um, is, is there a, an organization of some sort, uh, either national or, or, or regional, 
that you can go to 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 hone down your your search for a vocal coach and rather than going to one and saying oops this is the wrong one and then going to another one and saying oops this is the wrong one then the association that I belong to is the National Association of Teachers of Singing and if you uh, almost any metropolitan area and some rural areas will have members of that organization uh, they, there is a website the national NATS NATS dot org www.nats.org Bob Knopfsinger, Pullman, Washington several times you've mentioned healthy uh, what's going on when uh, you decide to practice the whole dance in the afternoon and then you go to the dance and you call it in the evening and seemingly you strain your voice or something like that the strain often comes when muscle sets lock against each other and that can happen in your breathing and it can happen in your throat but there is kind of a balance in nature there is a kind of an opposition in in every single thing that for everything that goes up there's something that goes down and everything that goes right there's something that goes left and everything that's black there's a white and there's just uh, opposites as part of the world and our bodies are absolutely set up in opposing forces if I want my arm to go out I don't push it out with my bicep I pull it out with my tricep if I want my arm to go in the bicep works and so those two muscles work in opposition with each other and if they get to the point where they're both flexing equally then I get no movement but enormous amount of work and muscle strain people who do exercises isometrically have learned that if they overdo it they can um, damage the joints and the ligaments of the joints and therefore it's important that whatever exercising you do is done in a balanced way that's why I was saying as you move back and forth between each other you don't push so hard that you your muscles start to quiver and you don't engage so laxly that one hand falls away from the other hand likewise in your body however if you find that equilibrium it's a kind of a blessed state it really is a fun place to be and when you find that state and you get good at it you can call a dance in the afternoon you can call a dance in the evening singers who are adept at what they're doing and do it properly can easily manage to sing six hours a day but those who are not have a hard time making it an hour and a half a day and so it has to do with being in shape but more than being in shape it has to do with being in equilibrium with yourself over here Jeff Priest, Toronto, Ontario um, singing with a cold are we doing damage? Uh, are there certain things we should or shouldn't do? that's a very good question and the answer is complex but not overly uh, if you can if the, if the cold is not in your throat if your vocal folds are not swollen up there is no reason for you not to be able to sing because those are the vibrators that have to be activated if you have a chest cold but it hasn't affected your throat you can sing if your head cold and it hasn't affected your throat you can sing how do you know because often with the head cold you get that raw throated burning sensation that comes from post nasal drip the infections in your nose it starts dripping down your throat the back of your throat gets sore and tender you think I've got a sore throat I can't sing and so you favor your throat and you end up doing yourself harm your vocal folds may not be affected how can you tell you can do a siren and if you can do that you can sing because you can stretch to the full extent of your range and they're way beyond if however you go we then don't sing because when your vocal folds are swollen up they are used to going to a certain degree of closure and the edema that's associated with them will cause them to be more closed than they would otherwise be that is the same thing as singing with a pressed production and those vocal folds bang against each other and that just exacerbates the edema and the swelling so then you sing harder and that you push it harder and before you know it you're a horse you've got laryngitis and cannot continue to sing there is one more partial answer to that question but I'm gonna turn to these other edema means swelling um, what is your opinion on people taking medications such as chloroseptic which deadens it or um, uh, anything that has a fume to it like a menthol in terms of the 
let me turn to the other medicines, the, the medicines that actually affect your vocal folds. Those are decongestants and antihistamines. And those can be trouble for you, particularly antihistamine, because they have a drying effect. They dry your sinuses, but they dry everywhere where there's moisture in your body. And your throat, particularly your vocal folds, need lots of moist lubrication. And so decon um, antihistamines can present trouble for singers. They make the mucus around your vocal folds thick and sticky. And so when the vocal folds spring, clo spring closed, they don't come apart easily because they're sort of semi-glued together because of that dried mucus. Uh, so antihistamines can be much of a trouble for singers. When I'm in trouble and I'm trying to control my, my, the flow, I take an antihistamine before I go to bed so that I won't drown in my own juices. When I get up the next morning, I take a decongestant because then I can blow my nose and clear my sinuses as they start to run again. That's the strategy that I personally use, but everybody can work out their own. Now back to the questions that you raised concerning chloroseptic or menthol. The chloroseptic, I promise you, all you're doing when you take chloroseptic is you're bathing the back part of your throat. That's, that's where all of the nerve endings are. It, and having that part of your throat deadened doesn't matter. I can tell you that if you got chloroseptic on your vocal folds, you'd know it. As you do every time you drink something down the wrong opening and you gag and cough. And something strong as chloroseptic, you'd know that it was there. But I don't think there's any difficulty with, uh, with gargling, with chloroseptic or a mouthwash. That deadens the upper part of your throat. The spray that comes in, all that does is deaden the nerves, um, mute the nerves, right at the soft palate level and the upper part of the throat. Menthol, I don't, I'm not aware of any difficulties that are associated with menthol, the inhalation of those, those fumes. First of all, they're not strong enough. They're very mild. And they are more, um, what do you call it, where it, it affects your perception rather than the reality. They make you feel better because you think you're doing something. The quasi placebo kinds of things. So have at them. Two minutes. Okay, then I was going to say there was one more partial answer to singing sick. Even when your vocal folds are slightly swollen, you can still sing and no one will know it. And the way you do that is that you imagine singing breathily. When you imagine singing breathily, your vocal folds will open, they will come apart ever so slightly. And then you increase the breath stream until you hit that Bernoulli effect moment. And they will happen. But when you part them, the swelling isn't, ex isn't as bad. I mean, it's still there, but it doesn't rub against itself. You open them to the point where you find the edges of the vocal folds, and then you can sing. And I promise you, nobody else will know you're a cold. You'll feel horrible, and nobody else will know you're, you've got a cold. But don't go there if when you go, oh, or, and there's a part of your range that you just can't get. That's the time when you cancel the dance. So if you start here and your voice is congested in your nose, don't worry about it. You don't sing in your nose anyway very much. But you do have it, however, have, if you have swelling in your vocal folds, you just start. Uh, 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 uh. Now I'm singing with my vocal folds abnormally opened and have just increased the breath stream until they hit that threshold and then they spontaneously vibrate and it's the inner edges of the cords the, the ligamental edges don't suffer edema, it's the flesh that surround them that does so you just sing on the ligaments that's easy for me to say so maybe I don't want to encourage you too much but that is another strategy that people who are ill learn to do please, if you will all sign the sheet then Caller Lab will develop some sort of certificate that said that you are here and that you were attentive. And you actually all did very, very well today. Congratulations to you.